Hi, I'm Valerie Bodell. Don Rice and I are verbally representing an excerpt of Superman Red Sun, written by Mark Miller. In order to comply with copyright laws, we can only represent a small part of the comic. I hope it is enough for you to get the idea of the story. Some of the pages are not numbered. When they are, we'll tell you what page we're on. This comic answers the question, what would have happened if Superman, an iconic American hero, contemporaneously depicted as a brave, kind, champion of justice and morality, had landed in Russia? Washington, D.C. The White House at night with brightly lit entrance and an interior room lighted. President Eisenhower addresses the nation. My fellow Americans, it has long been the duty of this great office to make public those developments which may affect our standing as a free and democratic nation. I regret to inform you that such a development took place this morning. The Soviet authorities today released to the world secret government pictures of a costumed individual more effective than our hydrogen bomb. An alien Superman committed to communist ideals whose very existence threatens to alter our position as a world superpower forever. This afternoon, I shall fly to Helensky to discuss this crisis with my fellow NATO leaders and decide upon a measured response to the situation. In the meantime, I would like to issue a request for calm and a hope that you might join me in a prayer that our predicament is not as terrible as it seems. The citizenry listen to radios and watch TV broadcasts with intense, fearful expressions. The president walks with two men in black suits and addresses them. Super hearing, impenetrable skin, eyes that can see through walls and fire laser beams? Where did the Russians find this guy, boys? One of the men answers. He has red hair and wears glasses. Believe it or not, they say he grew up on a collective farm somewhere in the Ukraine, Mr. President. Our sources say his rocket ship crashed there 30 years ago and that he was raised by the same simple farming folk who dug him out of the ground. The president responds, Just think, Agent Olson, if that rocket had landed 12 hours earlier, this Superman they're talking about would have been an American citizen. Page 14. A text box at the top left identifies the location as Star Labs Metropolis. A pair of white doves rise into a sunlit sky between soft clouds. A well-dressed man leans on an expensive car reading a book, listening to a recording machine, and speaking to chess players at long tables around him. Board 11, King to F7, checkmate. Board 12, Rook to B3, checkmate. Board 14, Queen to F4, checkmate. Thank you for a highly st stimulating coffee break, gentlemen. Board 7 played particularly well this afternoon. I was so distracted from Machiavelli's Il Principe for a moment that I almost turned two pages at once by mistake. Agent Olson approaches the man and speaks, but the well-dressed man must turn off the recorder before he can hear him. One moment, young man. Just let me switch off this portable tape recorder I designed in the washroom this morning. I'm teaching myself Urdu to keep my mind busy while I'm reading and playing chess with the monkeys. I assume you're Agent James Olson, of course? Olson replies. Heck, I heard you were the smartest man alive, Dr. Luther. But you've got to tell me, sir, how the blazes did you figure that one out? As the two men enter Star Labs, Dr. Luther explains, You had an appointment, Agent Olson. Now please, step into my lab and let me show you where I am with this anti-Superman deterrent you're pay paying such ludicrous amounts of money for. In Russia, page 54. Superman wears a red cape and black bodysuit with a five-sided figure outlined in red on his chest. Inside the outline are a red hammer and sickle. He addresses a woman and child. This isn't right, Lana. These children shouldn't have to stand in line and beg for food like they're some kind of animals. Superman then turns to address a figure behind a barred window. There are many people in line at the window, all waiting for food. Give this woman something to eat, comrade. Her boy and girl haven't eaten since they got here, for God's sakes. A man in the crowd asks, But what about us, Superman? We're all hungry, and my own children here haven't eaten all day either. Another man in the crowd lifts his hand and says, Some of us haven't eaten in weeks. Another adds, Things are only going to get worse now that Stalin's dead too. I've got a friend in supplies who says we aren't getting grains for the rest of the month. Lana is a beautiful woman with red hair and a determined expression. She says, it's okay, Superman. It's not your fault. It's just the way the system works, you know? You can't take care of everyone's problems. Superman responds. Actually, I can, Lana. I could take care of everyone's problems if I ran this place. And to tell you the truth, there's no, re no good reason why I shouldn't. The crowd of waiting people cheer, clap, raise their fists in the air, and smile. They are in front of a government building where two huge red banners hang, one with Lenin's profile and the other with Stalin's. Superman rises above the crowd to fly off and declares, 
Tell your friends they don't have to be scared or hungry anymore, comrades. Superman is here to rescue them. Page 62. In the intervening pages, Stalingrad has been reduced to minuscule size and stored in a specimen container reminiscent of a bell jar. Moscow, a museum do docent addresses a small group of tourists in a room with odd alien exhibits. And so this marked the end of the short-lived Luther-Brainiac partnership, but only the beginning for the tragic people of Stalingrad. To this day, our great leader has been unable to solve their predicament, and their names are etched here forever in the Superman Museum so that we might never forget. Over the years, the American CIA has funded the construction of an entire rogues gallery of super criminals built by the prolific Dr. Lex Luthor, the Parasite, Metallo, the Atomic Skull, Pizarro, all designed to assassinate Superman and restore the fading fortunes of the United States of America, all thankfully quite unsuccessful. Page 63. A large, blonde, muscle-bound museum guard points a baton at a citizen wearing a hat hiding his eyes. Only 90 seconds at each exhibit, comrade. Keep in step with the other tourists or face rigorous psychological examination. I'm sorry, my friend. I was in a world of my own. The citizen walks slowly towards the tour group, looking back over his shoulder. The docent stands in front of a world map. The Soviet Union was just a fragile assembly when Superman first came to power. Two decades later, and the whole world is our ally. Only the United States and Chile choose to remain independent, the last two capitalist economies on Earth, and both on the brink of fiscal and social collapse. The rest of the world was glad to volunteer total control to Superman and watched in awe as he rebuilt their societies, running their affairs more efficiently than any human could. Poverty, disease, and ignorance have been virtually eliminated from the Warsaw Pact states. Disobedience to the party has been virtually eliminated. The citizen with the hat-hooded eyes stands at the back of the group, his eyes shaded, his mouth set grimly. Page 101. Red text boxes with yellow text are superimposed on an image of a Russian city of large buildings, lighted windows, and helicopters cruising the sky. Time passed and my grip grew tighter. Rarely a decision was made across the length and breadth of the Soviet Union without my permission in some form or another. A man surreptitiously offers another an open briefcase. The red text box in the corner states, The population was largely grateful and obedient, but the freedom fighters inspired by the death of Batman remained something of a problem. A smaller square imbued with blue shows a stern-faced Batman with clenched fists, and text boxes continue. My desire for order and perfection was matched only by their dreams of violence and chaos. At the bottom of the page, a snow-lined street and sidewalk passed by a crudely painted silhouette of Batman in black and dripping paint. I offered them utopia, but they fought for the right to live in hell. Stalingrad. A label at the top of the page indicates that the scene has moved into the tiny city of Stalingrad in ruins. Blocks and girders are piled and exposed. Cars are crushed. People help each other out of the rubble. Fires burn, and a huge alien appendage is visible above the destruction. A disembodied voice explains, We lost the Opera House, the Olympic Stadium, 40 or 50 apartment blocks, and God knows how many people before we killed it, Superman. A uninformed official continues, Where were you? It's difficult enough maintaining some kind of order in this place without handling problems like this. You're supposed to check the filters every 24 hours. A projection of Superman replies, I'm so sorry, comrades. The first organism to slip past my microscopic vision in all these years. I can hardly believe I allowed this to happen. I've just been so distracted lately. A huge, grotesque creature is now visible atop the wreckage. It is an odd mud brown and green color with spikes protruding and jointed appendages. Not only will I double my efforts to bring Stalingrad back to its natural size, but you'll have my word I'll check the filter tubes on an hourly basis from this moment. Again, I can only offer my apologies. I promise I'll never let you down again. Virtual image off. Superman out. Superman now sits in front of the entrapped Stalingrad and addresses Brainiac. How could you do this, Brainiac? What kind of monster would trap an entire civilization inside a sample jar? It's the most grotesque thing I've ever seen. Brainiac answers with a synthesized computer voice. Forgive me, Superman, but I disagree with your assertion. I cared for these cultures and tended to their every requirement to survive as a species. You can't blame an alien supercomputer for storing information. All I was doing was following my original prime directive. Superman replies, but you took away what made them human, and there's never an excuse for that. Brainiac, failing to regrow these people has been the black spot of my career. Page 134. The United States is under attack from Superman and Brainiac. Superman confronts Lex Luthor's wife, Lois, on the steps of the White House. 
I respect the fact that you're taking a stand like this, but we're destroying everything within a five-mile radius of the Pentagon, and I don't want anyone hurt. Lois replies, I'm sorry, Superman, but this is my home, and I'm not budging an inch. I don't think you understand, ma'am. Your Air Force has been neutralized, and your super people have been scattered to the winds. America's finished. I'm afraid you don't have anything left to hit me with. Lois says, actually, we've still got one shell left in our arsenal, Superman. If you think I'm kidding, just take a look at the letter in my inside pocket. With the greatest respect, Mrs. Luther, I hardly think a brown manila envelope is going to stop me in my tracks, even if it does have a presidential seal. Page 136. Superman collapses to his knees in a posture of abject sorrow and defeat. Oh my God, what have I done? All I wanted was to put an end to all the wars and famines. I only wanted the best for everyone. You've got to believe me. Lois, stunned, opens the envelope. What the hell is in this letter? And reads the handwritten note. Why don't you just put the whole world in a bottle, Superman? Brainiac chimes in. Superman, you appear distressed. What's wrong? Hovering above Lois and Superman, Brainiac is encased in an enormous blue tentacle-encrusted ship with ineffectual explosions flaring beneath as missiles and planes converge. Superman regains some of his composure, but is plainly miserable. I'm just as bad as you were, Brainiac. I'm just another alien bullying a less developed species, and it's morally unjustifiable. Switch off your weapon systems, comrade. We're going home. A closer view of Brainiac shows a vaguely humanoid form suspended in innumerable tubes. But you can't stop now when you're on the brink of utopia, Superman. Denying them perfection is more morally corrupt than enforcing it. At least leaving them alone means they can make their own mistakes again, comrade. Luther's right. This isn't how the world was meant to be. We weren't born here, and we've got no right to interfere. And that is your final decision? Is there nothing I can say which might change your mind on this matter? Superman now has an intense, determined look. Nothing, Brainiac. Absolutely nothing. Brainiac's mechanical head is shrouded in an unearthly green light. Well, I'm afraid that's just unacceptable, Man of Steel. Brainiac explodes in a powerful blast of yellow, orange, and red flames leaping outward and disintegrating its body. Luther stands alone in a well-protected room wearing a heavy spacesuit and staring at a chessboard. Superman gone, Brainiac gone. The world ready to embrace Lutherism even more readily than ever before. One could almost be forgiving for thinking that this had all been worked out to the tenth decimal point forty years ago, eh? Luther moves the chess king, and as the view expands, he says, Checkmate, Superman.